I want to take this opportunity to thank you because it's really good for me to be in this kind of environment to see the kind of thinking and the advancement of the low-carb, high-fat message, which is really important. Right now, my company has been doing some advocacy work. Uh, we were up on the Hill trying to talk to the USDA senators and congressmen and telling them that Food Guide Bureau of Mid is wrong. 52% of the population is pre-diabetic or diabetic, and you're still telling them to eat 60% of the calories and carbohydrate. And your national education library is missing two decades of low carbohydrate research that was funded by the NIH. And right behind me was the Nutrition Coalition and Nina. And right behind her was uh, Nusi and Gary Tabs and Peter. So the message really resonated. And we managed to get language in the omnibus bill that there's going to be an independent review by the NIH on the process of who's selected, because they need more diversity on the, um, on the Science Advisory Committee. So we're making baby steps. But you know, talking to the government <laughs> is really like banging your head against the wall and hoping you break through or you get knocked out you know, again. And then we're also doing advocacy work talking to registered dietitians. The dietitians the media go to for opinions. You know, these are dietitians that stake their brand on diets don't work. And trying to convince people, oh, if you just eat healthy, you'll be OK. So I've been talking to them. <laughs> and I also sit on the corporate science advisory boards for the Obesity Society and the American Heart Association. So you guys are a breath of fresh air, I have to tell you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed meeting everybody. And you know, thank you for inviting me. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the Atkins diet and what's happened over these last 40 years since Dr. Atkins had his revolutionary ideas. And in my effort to try to communicate to mainstream, you know, senators, registered dietitians, health organizations, I tried to find language that everybody could understand. What are some major nutrition principles that we could all get on the same page about. So we could all agree that one size doesn't fit all. Even in the realm of ketogenic diets, there isn't one level of carbohydrate that everybody does well at. You know, if you're reversing cancer or if reversing diabetes, it has to be low carb because you've traveled longer along the disease path. And in order to reverse it, you have to stay closer to very low carbohydrate in order to reverse the disease process. Or if you're an elite athlete and you're looking for that magic ketotic state. But one level of carbohydrate isn't appropriate for everybody, nor is low carb appropriate for everybody. So that message is resonates. And experts all agree that a particular diet, if it works and reverses risk factors for disease, it's a good diet for you. What's your lipid profile looking like? What's your blood sugar looking like? What's your markers for heart disease looking like? So those are the kind of things that we could all agree that's common sense nutrition. And the future of nutrition is being able to talk to people, the lay person. How do we communicate to them You know, the, what is healthy when the message out there is diets don't work? And so people are using diets of their own design. They're taking a little bit from every diet. They're doing low carb, low fat, high fiber, high protein. And they're doing you know, different combinations of things. And it doesn't always work when you do that. So our challenge to everybody in this room is to be able to communicate and advise people on how to make the best choices and use common sense general nutrition principles that will resonate in the mainstream, will resonate with people trying to do diets of their own design because they don't want to do what they consider rigid diets. And there's a couple of things. There's overarching in principles we could all agree on. Protein's important. It furnishes materials in your body that you need to make muscle, organs, hair, neurotransmitter. And compared to carbohydrates, protein has less of an effect on insulin as we all learn today, is, is the real couple that we need to control, and, and it, which drives fat storage, and has a greater effect on glucagon, which drives fat release. 
So protein is important. That we could all agree on. High fiber carbohydrates. If you're going to eat carbohydrates, make sure they're high in fiber because fiber is important for a lot of reasons. Moderates swings in blood sugar, slows the entry time of glucose into the bloodstream, binds cholesterol in the intestine, absorbs, and then eliminates bacteria in the gut. We learned a little bit about that with the microbiome. And it supports the immune system and low sugar. That's all we heard for two days so far. You have to keep sugar low. So those carbohydrates have got to be low in sugar in order to have optimal health. And one of my favorites is the theory of advanced glycation end products called ages. Wouldn't it be great if we could tell people you could slow the aging process if you kept sugar low and you kept insulin low? And ages are compounds that happen in the blood when sugar attaches to protein and tissue, and it causes atherosclerosis, feeble muscles. Diabetics have a shorter lifespan for this. So here's some general principles that resonate in the mainstream that consumers could latch on to, and it brings them closer to low-carbohydrate thinking. And yet, they're bombarded in a food environment that gives them constant challenges, like when they walk <laughs> for a snack, and they're trying to go, okay, I need low sugar and high protein and high fiber, and all they see is sugar in, in, the, you know, in any place you go. So it is a challenge. So here comes Dr. Atkins, 40 years ago, who had a revolutionary idea, and it was pretty profound at the time. He said people who fail at reaching their dietary, you know, losing weight or general health, it's not a personal failure. It's the failure of the diet that they were on, because diet has such a profound effect on how we feel. And that was great. I mean, that was our brand roots. I mean, we were an information company out there trying to, you know, set the record straight, let people know it doesn't have to be low fat. It doesn't have to be, um, that's not the only answer. There's a viable option to disease. And so I made the switch from being a nutritionist in doctor's offices for 15 years. I switched over to corporate because I too wanted to have more of a global impact on the message. And I had the opportunity to get into publishing through Atkins Nutritionals. And the first book in 1972, which is what drove Dr. Atkins to the acclaim that he well deserved, um, the Atkins diet at that time was much like Dr. Westman's diet at the Duke Clinic. Three cups of vegetables, no real limit on protein because the doctors knew that protein is self-limiting, carbohydrates are reinforcing. So there's no sense to limit protein, just keep them satisfied. Uh, and then in 2002 was the book that I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Atkins on, and that's when we introduced net carbs, when we found out fiber has a minimal impact on blood sugar. There's no need to restrict fiber because of all the health benefits we talked about before. And then in 2014 was the last book I worked with Dr. Atkins on, and, and that's when we talked more about the four phases of Atkins and not just induction. How to graduate through phase two, phase three, phase four, find your individual level of carbohydrate tolerance. At what point do you start storing fat? And everybody's different. And the only way to know that is if you go through the phases, follow the carbohydrate ladder, introduce one new low glycemic, high fiber carbohydrate at a time, and find at what level do you start storing fat again? At what level of carbohydrate intake do you stop burning fat? So those are the four phases in Atkins for Life. And the latest and the greatest, which I had the privilege and the honor to work with Dr. Westman, Steve Finney, and Jeff Volek, um, and that was the new Atkins for New You. And here we really honed the message. We had the introduction of the mandatory level of foundation vegetables, where when someone starts on phase one and they're taking in 20 grams of carbohydrate a day, 15 of those carbs need to come in the form of vegetables. And that mitigates some of the side effects. You're getting the antioxidants, you're getting the phytochemicals, you're getting the fiber you need, and you don't have somebody doing a diet of their own design. Well, I'm doing Atkins and my 20 carbs is coming in a slice of bread. So you know, they're getting 
the nutrients and the fiber that they need. We have a chapter on optimal protein intake, a well-constructed, low-carb, high-fat diet is moderate in protein. And where our critics get us, and the argument I'm having constantly in mainstream, is that they point to science that you know, is too high in protein, like the protein-sparing fast diet, or you know, some other diet that was way too high in protein, and too high in carbohydrates, and saying, well, that's where it's dangerous. So we really have a whole chapter on giving them targets uh, based on height and gender on how to achieve your optimal protein intake. We have a chapter on fat is your friend. And of course, Dr. Finney's brilliant addition of salt and how that can mitigate the adaptation phase. So the major evolution of the Atkins diet is very little, really. In the 40 years, he, Dr. Atkins was way ahead of his time. All we've done is hone in on the message that there's an optimal level of protein you can't do low carb and low fat. Fat is an essential nutrient in a low carbohydrate diet. Vegetables and fiber is important. Uh, salt is important. Um, low calorie is not gonna work <laughs> in a low carb diet. You need a certain amount of cal calories to fuel the metabolism. But, and oh, and Dr. Finney introduced the image of the metabolic bully, which I think is really clever being carbohydrates, you know, who's the bully in the park? Who's gonna, who's gonna get in the way of you burning fat? And the metabolic bully is carbohydrates. So that's what we did in the new Atkins for Neo. So approaching weight loss with a low carb, high fat diet works because it forces the individual to run on their backup fuel system, which is fat burning. The secret is to find the level that works for you, and that's where it gets a little tricky. And for most people, you could burn fat at 50 grams of total carb or less. That's really true for a major part of the population, and that's what's been evident in the clinical research that's been published over the last 20 years. Phase one, we, over the course of the history of the Atkins diet, was the place at 20 net carbs we told everybody to start because it gave the people with the most carbohydrate intolerance, pre-diabetics, metabolic syndrome, the best shot at success. But we realize that there are some individuals that could start at 40 or 50 and have as much success. And thus, we've in, recently, in 2015, talking about the evolution of the Atkins diet, we've introduced the Atkins 40 program. So for those who have less weight to lose, who don't have a waist circumference indicative of metabolic syndrome, it's 35 inches or less uh, for women, 40 inches or less for men, they could come into the program at a 40 gram level, and I'll show you some of the science that supports that. And the new entry is an option. The original Atkins program is still there. You could start at 20 net carbs if that's where you need to be if you're pre-diabetic, or if you need a more flexible program, you have less weight to lose, you're younger, but you just, you hear that lower carb is better, higher protein is better, higher fiber is better, and you don't know how to do it, the Atkins 40 starting point is a viable option. The same nutritional principles that we talked about in, in the beginning, high fiber, nutrient dense carbohydrates, optimal protein levels, healthy fats. So, when an individual comes to the website, we ask them three questions you know, to, to identify the metabolic syndrome patient. And simply, what's your waist circumference? How much weight do you have to lose? And do you need tight guardrails in order for you to succeed? In that case, we drive them to the Atkins 20 original program. If somebody comes in and says, you know what? I would never consider doing low carb if I can't have a piece of fruit. I have to have my berries, or I have to have my nuts. Well, you know what? If you're not too overweight, you're not pre-diabetic, you could start at the Atkins 40 program. And this is a way to bring in more people. I totally believe that the, the entire population could benefit from some form of carbohydrate awareness, some form of carbohydrate restriction, because they've been fat-phobic 
for so long, you want to give them an awareness of carbohydrate the way the fat indoctrination has overtook our consciousness for the last 30 years. And we tell them, spread out the carbs during the day. Don't have it all in one meal. 10 grams of carbohydrate at each meal, 5 grams of carbohydrate at your snacks. Continue to use the moderate protein. There's still the mandatory requirement of foundation vegetables. So it's pretty much the same, except they have a wider variety of food to choose from. And the key benefit for certain individuals is that it's a more sustainable way of eating. So in the maintenance phase of Atkins 40, they have no carb ladder to go up to find their critical carbohydrate tolerance and where they start storing fat again. So instead, we just add 10 grams of carbohydrate per week in the form of nutrient-dense carbohydrates until they could find, so they go from 40 to 50, 50 to 60, and then they'll find the level of carbohydrate that they can intake for the rest of their life. Because what I find is people do induction, lose their weight, go back to their old way of eating, gain all their weight, come back, do induction, lose their weight. That's yo-yo dieting. You need to give people a way that they could eat for the rest of their life. And somebody that's highly motivated, like myself, I'm fine with 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate. I don't need more than that for the rest of my life. But there are other individuals, and the more people we can bring in to the low carbohydrate umbrella, the better, and this gives them that flexibility. So I looked at the science, because my first question is, what does the science tell us? Are they going to succeed? Will they lose weight if they start here? And I found in the, my library, we had 38 studies that were lower than 40 grams of carbohydrate, between 20 and 40. I found 31 studies that were indicative of the starting point of 40 net carbs. And I looked at the weight loss averaged out over a period of shorter than one year or longer than one year. And the weight loss wasn't that different. Um, on the, they lost 7.6 kilograms on the low fat, a low carb, high fat, lower than 40, and 7.3 kilograms. Um, longer than one year, it was a little different, but not that much different. Um, so you still get the weight loss, and the 31 studies were consistent with 25 to 60 grams of net carb a day. And the thing that, it was serendipitous, because while I was thinking about this new entry point, and why ruin a good thing, Atkins diet works. I mean, why are we missing it? You know, why are we bringing in a new entry point? You know, we want to reach more people, true, but, you know, why should we change it? Well, Buzano came up with a study in 2014 individuals, his, his starting point was 40 grams of carbohydrate. Uh, and with all these studies, they're all free-living population. They're not in metabolic wards. They're keeping food diaries. So I know this isn't really precise, but this is all we have to go by. All of the peer review, randomized controlled trials use free-living population. So, but in his population, they consumed 78 to 112 grams of net carb a day. They lost 3.5 after a year. Saslo individuals consumed an average of 58 grams of total carb and still lost 5.5 kilograms. In Tay, the individuals were instructed to take in less than 50. He kept them closer to 50 and lost 12 kilograms. And what's consistent in the literature is the lower the carbohydrate intake, the more profound the health benefits. I mean, they lost more weight. The lower, the closer they stayed to that original entry point, whether it was 20, whether it was 40, even if there was carb creep, and they wound up taking in a lot more carbohydrates, in the literature, it's consistent. Um, but they all had beneficial effects on the lipid profile. HDL went up, triglycerides went down, glucose improved, insulin improved. So even at the high carb level, you're still getting the beneficial effects of metabolic syndrome. And this slide is just too much to go through, but you'll have access to the presentations if you want to go into more detail. I broke it out by the author in the year, the number of participants that were in the study, the length of the study, prescribed grams of carbohydrate for the study. The, this is what's amazing to me the actual grams of carbohydrate consumed 
in the study. People cheat, guys. <laughs> I mean, just you can't keep them that low that long. As much as we try, even if they're in a study. But if they kept it low enough, and low enough was under 120 grams of carbohydrate a day, they lost weight. They had the beneficial effects on the lipid profile. And the lower they were, the more beneficial. But they still had some of the beneficial effects of low carbohydrate. And here are the rest of the studies. So, oh, and we had some consumer research. We recruited 40 people and put them on Atkins 40, see how they'd done. And they all said, wow, I can get my husband on this diet now. He wouldn't do it with me before. Or, or I love more variety. I love the flexibility. It taught them portion control, which was really good. They taught them what carbohydrates have. You know, people don't realize how many carbs are in a bagel. They don't know that a Cliff Bar, even though it has a healthy halo, has a lot of sugar in it. So, you know, it really taught them um, the difference of the amount of carbohydrates in different foods. And they all said they appreciated the wider, wider variety of food. So in conclusion, the Atkins diet is an organized program, helps you achieve permanent weight control with intelligent consumption of carbohydrates. It's a lifetime healthy eating plan. If you find that level of carbohydrates below which you'll maintain, you'll lose weight, above which you'll gain weight, and at that magical point of carbohydrate intake that'll allow you to uh, maintain your weight for the rest of your life. And it's backed by science. So thank you very much. Thank you.